from our consolidated independent school districts called to order at 6.30 p.m. This is our board workshop <coughs> held on January 14, 2020. We have a quorum with all our members present. We will review the agenda items for our meeting for January 16th. So we can begin, Dr. Randall. Madam President, I call the board's attention to uh, the public hearing. Uh, this is a, uh, a requirement that uh, all school districts have to do, and so we will get a uh, presentation uh, for that as well as hold a public hearing on Thursday. The next item on the agenda is uh, that the Board of Trustees approve out-of-state travel for the George Ranch High School speech and debate team to travel to Boston, Massachusetts on February 14th through 18th, 2020. The next item, we ask the Board of Trustees to authorize applying for a waiver for a full day pre-kindergarten in the 2019-2020 school year. You remember we uh, discussed the fact that that's what we would um, uh, be doing in January and uh, applying for the waiver. Any other? Go ahead. Do you have a question? I guess she's going to go. Are you doing a presentation? Right okay. Go for it. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to kind of debrief us a little bit on the journey that we have taken together since possibly June of 2019, but we first began talking about this in August of 2019. So pre-K update of January 2020. We began with, yes, HB 1, uh, 3, excuse me, did mandate that full-day pre-K would be implemented across the state, um, that an exemption may be applied if an LEA would construct facilities or fewer children would be served. We uh, did state that fewer children would be served because of the staffing that we currently had and the pool of candidates that we currently had by moving uh, half-day programs to full day, there would be kids left out. So our intention was to apply for an exemption in uh, January of 2020 when TEA relate, released uh, the exemption paperwork. So exemptions for full day, this again came from the Texas Education Agency. Um, effective September 1st was <coughs> HB3 law. Uh, waiver requests would be available from TEA no later than January 1st, 2020 for the 1920 school year. I know that's confusing. Um, and we did receive the exemption or the waiver at the end of December right directly before the winter break. Applications will be due no later than March 2nd and uh, they would let us know within 30 days if they're approving or not approving within 30 days, and then we could apply for a one, two, or three year. Our in intention has always been that we would apply for the waiver um, in January and that we would move to full implementation in August of 2020. So when you look at, again, just going to take you back to the original presentation, we began talking about August of 2019. Time was extended at Seguin Elementary, or excuse me, Early Childhood Center, and then we added minutes, we provided transportation, and then we completed the English proficiency exams at the elementary campuses to continue to uh, ascertain um, how many kids would qualify. On September 17th, we did an action item in regard for a call for proposals. On September 20th was the last day to enroll in Seguin Early Childhood Center. And then we began on September 23rd to determine additional space, which we made available to other Title I campuses. In October of 2019, we began reviewing the proposals. Originally, it said listen, and then we began to look at the law. It was reviewing uh, the proposals, which we did through an RFP process. Uh, we had a public meeting in October, and then we moved to reviewing uh, all of those RFPs in the October-November time period. We updated you on November 19th, and then in December 2019, the original goal was that we were going to be able to bring forward an MOU. However, when we began to look at all of our early childhood centers, there were, there were not any teachers that were certified to teach pre-K according to TEA standards. They had endorsements, <coughs> many of them, but did not have the requirements that TEA had, had requested or have, you have to have. 
So in January 2020, um, we, our intention again was to work with those early learning centers um, to develop an MOU to move our kids into those programs without teachers. Um, that was a little bit limited um, and that we were going to apply for the exemption when the exemption process came available. So what are the basics? One of the things is you had to qualify for two different areas. One of the two was repurposing facilities, but the other one is that you qualified if implementing full day would result in fewer eligible children being enrolled in pre-kindergarten, which is where we felt that we um, fit within this exemption process. Uh, applying for that, we would be requesting uh, exemption from full-day pre-kindergarten through the Texas Education Agency. Then districts should apply for a one-year, two-year, or three-year, which is available. Our intention has always been just to apply for this school year with full implementation going into August of 2020. And then uh, we could apply for a one-year or three-year, but a uh, two-year or three-year, but whatever we apply for, we, the LEA has to be able to implement um, what, their, what this portion of it begin offering full-day pre-kindergarten for all eligible four-year-old students um, to apply for the exemption renewal. So this is kind of where we are. This is the exemption process. So I'm going to segue a little bit into now what is our current plan based upon the actions that we have taken for the first semester. Number one, when we brought forward in August of 2020, the pre or 2019, the presentation, we said we would need to be look we would look at budgeting, <coughs> we would look at space utilization, we'd look at staffing, we would begin to review our for staffing, we would plan specialized training, we would look at the parent component of the family involvement plan. Uh, we would look at special rotations in the area of pre-K. And so when we began for budgeting, uh, as we've been working this past semester, we've been looking at furniture and how we're identifying furniture within the classrooms, uh, curriculum and supplies. We've been working on that as well. And then technology. Again, a cost proposal for student technology for classroom use to be included in our start-up budgets as we add these classrooms at the elementary level. Space utilization, we're looking at data throughout the district, both our kindergarten numbers and our current pre-K numbers, and then also that what we are going to get through our pre-K roundup. And then the number of classes, again, will be determined um, by the numbers that are eligible for the full day pre-K program. Uh, the staffing, as we talked about in August of 2020, the, we staff at an 11 to 1 ratio full-time teacher and one para, which equates to 22 students in a classroom. <coughs> and then originally when we began in August of 2020, um, we knew that this is what we were looking at, is that currently right now our projections were to hire 18.5 teachers and 19.5 paras. Our goal is in the spring and summer to continue to begin to hire those uh, early teachers that are certified <coughs> in early childhood uh, at our campuses. Um, as well as for our early childhood special ed program, formerly the PPCD program, they changed their name. And so it's now early childhood special ed. Then professional development, specialized professional development, we've planned for a three-day program. Topics include organizing your instructional day and transitioning to full-day pre-K, making the most of the instructional centers, CLI progress monitoring tool, social emotional development, and then specialized breakout sessions that would cover the 10 uh, domains, pre-K domains, and those would be also presented by the teacher leaders as well as our ALP department. Uh, we would refine our and family engagement plan by evaluating with our TEA rubric. Um, we would share that plan and post that um, on our website. And then we begin to collaborate with our Region 4 to begin to uh, review the specials implementations. And then our distributing, as far as communicating with our community, distributing pre-K registration files, uh, flyers to current families, advertising um, through our online platforms, implementing, um, implementing a media campaign, and partnering with community agencies as well as local realtors. 
um, because we know we are a fast growth district as well. We've got a lot of families that are coming in. Um, what this showed us, and I'm going to segue into that, our um, beginning to look at the proposals that our early learning centers could provide for us provided us an opportunity to review kind of what they offered at their campus and began to we began to evaluate the programs that we currently had in our schools that we could assist in getting kids interested in the education and training as well as in early childhood. And so we have been brainstorming and we came up with a couple of things. One of the things is a uh, is through our public services endorsement which is our education and training. There will be a practicum once they complete three classes, then in the 11th and 12th grade year, they would be able to move towards a practicum where they get their 480 hours so that they can sit for the CDA certification. The next part is we began to look at our marketing co-op program, and that is a work program currently where our kids are working at uh, different businesses throughout the surrounding city. And then we work to help support those kids in evaluating what is happening at the job. Um, and so that is a current program that we currently have. So it's going to look like this. As you look at the public services endorsement educating training, there are two pathways, one of which are teachers that might not want to do early, early childhood. The other ones are looking at early learning. As what you can see up there is there are three specific classes for a CTE coherent sequence of classes. And then they would segue into a practicum, which would be their junior and senior year. This is the CDA pathway. Once they have obtained the 480 hours, then they would sit before graduation for their CDA certification. Now, mind you, they're doing the, they're doing the practicum at these or at early learning centers. The second piece, because what we found when we began to evaluate this is kids were behind sometimes in their credits and couldn't fit all of these classes within their schedule. So the next piece of that was looking at our co-op program and student workers at our early learning centers is to begin to develop those relationships. We've already begun looking at what they offer, begin looking at student workers at the early learning centers, and then they would work their junior and senior year while they're participating in the co-op. And then after they graduate, they would be eligible with the 480 hours to sit for the CDA, which would still qualify for district certification for our CCMR. Then the dream would be next steps, possible applying for para positions. And again, this is not set in stone. These are just dreams. Possible next steps, apply for para positions in LCISD. And then eventually, four to five years later, when they have finished their degree, come back and teach in their hometown. So what is next? Uh, finally, in the spring, Thomas Elementary School will be moving to full day. We will begin that after the nine week and uh, we've already begun begun spoken with the families and then we will fill some open slots at Seguin uh, Early Childhood Center and there are 49 spots available currently right now. Uh, 16 are bilingual and 33 are for English uh, speaking and that is it. What questions do you have of me? Um, um, I have a couple questions. Uh, first, are other districts going to be doing the exemption in our area and then staffing up this summer to start it in fall of 2020? And if so, is, do you anticipate that causing uh, difficulty hiring teachers and paras for these new positions? Well, I think that currently right now, if you look at the state of, you know, there is a teaching shortage, so I can't stand up here and say that it, it might not be problematic. <coughs> However, uh, we are optimistic um, that if we begin early, that we will be able to staff accordingly. I know this is really Kathleen's area, um, but we're always going to be <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, there are, there's a number of districts. We're all competing for um, different, uh, for, for the teachers um, with the HB3 uh, mandate. And you need a so, yes, there are some other districts. I don't have all of the names that are applying for exemptions, but there are some throughout the state. 
the certification that you would need would be like certified pre-K through grade? A lot of time EC through six, correct? Through six. correct. The teacher certification would need to be EC through six. Okay. okay. Um, and then the second question that I had um, was on the marketing co-op, and you said that the student, there's going to be student workers at the ELCs. Are they going to be paid? Mm-hmm. Okay. And yes, that's how the marketing, that just, they, all of our high schools have a marketing program, okay. and so they're connected with businesses throughout our community, and the marketing teacher visits mm-hmm. the different, it's kind of job embedded training. And so one of the things that we found is that there might have been a drop in participation within our marketing co-op. Um, our concern in the pathways uh, was that there needs to be room in the schedule. And this provides an opportunity for us to really look at um, navigating some of our kids into the education and training programs that is a little different than what we have done in the past. I think that's great. And, and um are there student workers at ELCs now through the marketing co-op program? No. Okay. Do you there have been, but no, not currently. For, for the ELCs, would they, you know, I, I know that um, ratios is important for ELCs. Would they count towards those ratios? My, my concern is would the ELCs want to bring on our students and pay them if it's not going to um, go towards like the ratio of student to uh, um, teacher, teacher ratio, ratio at the ELC? No, I believe it will. Uh, we will totally verify that, but it will because they're going to be under their daycare guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, and, and they're under a different uh, guideline um, from the state when you're dealing with the early learning centers than what we are held accountable for. Okay, well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, how did the transition to the longer day and the transportation do at Sikki? Did it? No, we did not feel we had limited bumps. Good. It was successful. Good. And just, I know we want to go to full day pre K. Are we looking at some schools, most schools? Or are we going to still have to? Most train? schools. Okay, so we won't have to move kids that don't. We are hoping not. Okay. Our intention is not, but we're going to keep you updated, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Did you have some questions? No, you, yeah. No, go for it. Thank you so much. <laughs> She's so <Yeah>. happy. <laughs> I've, been, I've been hoping for this for the past seven years. Uh, um, <clears throat> let me just go on from that. The co-op students, uh, you said they would start in, at uh, the 11th grade? Yes, that's when it's offered. Okay. Okay. Um, in, in this application for the waiver, uh, I wasn't quite understanding at the in the uh, third paragraph where you're saying that the EL, ELCs do not have teachers that are certified to teach pre-K. By the state of Texas standards. Right. When I was reading this uh, TEA <clears throat> description, it was saying that, let's see how... The district or charter schools must solicit and consider proposals for partnerships with pub- public or private community-based child care providers who meet one of the following status requirements. But then when you go to another page, it's talking about the certified teacher. You have to be certified in the state of Texas to teach pre-K in a system, um, even if it's three-year-olds. We had checked with the state, with TEA and the representatives of TEA. You have to hold a certification in EC through six, plus the one of the seven endorsements. Okay. When I was reading it, it was like with, the teachers do not have to have, in addition, uh, to be part of the Texas Rising Star program, or they don't have to meet the any of these. That's a. It's separate. Okay. The Texas Rising program is through uh, the the daycare association. Mm-hmm. That is uh, the early learning centers kind of guiding uh, body, mm-hmm. I would say. Ours is under TEA, and any teacher that is going to teach our kids have to be certified by the state of Texas. How would you, if that is going to be the the major factor holding back, 
the community centers, how is that going to affect the whole program as a whole? Because I don't believe any local early centers have uh, degree teachers in early education. I would agree with that. So how does that program include the community? Clarify what you're asking. Well, so I think that what would end up happening is that the uh, ELCs would have to uh, employ uh, teachers that meet their qualifications in order to have kids unless uh, some districts can send a teacher to that ELC to okay, make their that, qualifications. That's what I was, I had read about something about that being a, a possibility. <clears throat> was that ever discussed or, or have y'all thought about that? Currently right now we have so many opportunities throughout our district to add, if we were to be able to add teachers that we would have to open up our current place, our current uh, areas that do have the space to do that. And so there was direct and indirect. And so, yes, we looked at all. The answer to your question is yes, we looked at all of those things. And the most uh, probably, you know, the best course of action for us at that point, because there were there were no certified teachers at this point, and as we continue to look at the pool of applicants, and if we were going to hire, we were going to be hiring for our current classrooms first. And so uh, we made the decision to kind of move forward we do not have the ability to do an MOU if they do not have certified teachers. So the program, because I know TEA was talking about collaborating, using a teacher to come to the facility, and then having those that are like CDA credentialed to come to the school district and do observations and working together. There's a number of models. That might be one of the models that is an option that is not our current model currently right now. So what we're going to do is concentrate on filling all of our schools, elementary schools, to the max and provide for as many uh, four-year-olds as we can. Yes. Our goal, as we have said, our intention, and always has been at the very beginning, is to ensure that we had full implementation um, in August of 2020, so the 20. 21 school year. Correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong on this, but uh, a part of the reason why this has been left open uh, to some degree is so that there can be ongoing conversations about if there are other ways to take and make those work. Uh, and I think that that's, that's one of the things that they, they attempted to do in the, in the uh, presentation. There. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I was just, you know, I'm thinking full time now. The other half in other words, we're having to fill two classes. We have to double up in every school. Would that be right? The numbers are going to dictate that. That's not necessarily true across the district. Okay. There are some that we would not have to do that. And there are some that we are going to have to double up. But our teachers, um, in us looking for teachers and continuing to their qualified to teach these classes, will be in the spring as well as in the summer in addition to our early childhood, uh, the early childhood special ed program. Okay. Um, if we have, because I know of a case of, of a place that has two certified teachers, but it's not in early childhood. If they go, if they go on and get their certification in, in early childhood, they can be considered. This. Absolutely, okay. as in any other teacher. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. All right. Good. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. This looks wonderful. We're excited. The next item on the agenda, we ask that the board of trustees ratify the quarterly investment report. The next item, we ask that the board consider approval of the uh, uh, Lamar CISD District <coughs> Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and you'll actually get a report on Thursday on that. The next item, we ask the board to consider approval of the purchase of two uh, 2020 Ford F-350 XLT dual rear wheel vehicles <laughs> from uh, Heffman Ford in the amount of $92,580. Um, no, you go ahead. Now, I just, I was looking at the chart. 
<laughs> under uh, the extent to which the goods or services meet the needs of the district. Classic Chevrolet was had a higher score. And in my mind, it was kind of, we want something to meet the needs of our district. It's on page 32. Oh, and also under long-term cost. They, In long, uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess the question is we don't understand vehicles, but those are two very kind of important areas. Uh, they were close, but uh, Heffman uh, actually was at a cheaper rate than okay. uh, uh, Classic. Okay. But we just have to pay a little bit more if we want them to be a better quality. Uh, I think there were a whole lot of different uh, factors that, that the team considered. Um, but ultimately, this is a, a weighted scoring matrix. And so the total points out of everything that they ranked is the important piece, and um, as well as the price overall. I know, so I saw the same thing and wondered how So yeah, were, just... were the products that they were looking at for help and forge classic Chevrolet and Caldwell, Caldwell Country Chevrolet, were they all the same vehicle, the same specifications? Same or? Specs. There were standard specifications given. Um, well, Amanda may want to um, I had a, I had a elaborate a little bit on that. I had a question mark on that, too, because I just didn't understand if it's everything is the same specs, how one could be 21.6 and one could be 25. Right, and that's, uh, I think that the CTE department personnel actually did that evaluation. Uh, so I, I don't know if you know the details of their evaluation. Or not. Okay. I mean, I think there are several things. Oh, good. Yay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, overall, we just found that the the all of the goods and services that were being offered were of similar quality, and that we just felt that the overall cost was the best benefit to the district. So we felt that that was the best, the best direction to go uh, in terms of taxpayer dollars. But I think the question is, uh, <coughs> which, uh, you better pose the question again. I don't want to put words in my mouth. It's the two areas that, that the they... Specifications are the same. If they're the exact same vehicle in every way from each of the three different dealerships, why one was 21.6 and one was 25? I think part of it came from just personal preference. You have uh, from the users of the actual vehicles, the, the end user being the ag teachers themselves, they probably felt that the classic or just that Chevrolet was what they prefer. However, in terms of looking at the quality of the vehicle and looking at the um, specifications, there wasn't that much variance, and therefore the overall cost benefit is what won one out for everyone. I think at one point during this process, I had heard that um, some of the vehicles have larger displays, that's, that's, and so if you. they're backing the vehicles, thank you. Um, you know, and they're trying to park or whatever, mm -hmm. um, just the visually they can see displays on certain vehicles better than others. Mm -hmm. So that may safety make reasons. them, yeah, right. safety reasons. That may make them choose one over the other. So we're going to replace the two vehicles. How, how much wear and tear is on the current one? Uh, they're, both, they're both over 100,000 miles. Um, I don't know specifically, but I know that one of them is a 2008 and one of them is a 2010. Um, the vehicles are used heavily by the Ag Department to haul trailers, haul livestock, haul equipment, transport students to the next. And so it's it's about time. <laughs> I just, uh, I'm just going to make a comment that because when I looked under the extent to which the services meet the needs of the district, mm -hmm. I mean, Chevrolet got 25. That's that's the max. And we're, talk, we're talking about $1,152. And part of that need also is, part of that need is proximity. 
with Classic being a little bit closer in case of need of service, uh, but Healthman being just a little bit further. So I believe part of that was built into it also. Needs in terms of if we need to go to the dealership to deal with the problem of the vehicle, they're a little bit closer. So that may have worn out a little bit also. And sometimes it's um, the length of time it's going to take for them to deliver the actual vehicle. I know that's coming into play. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item, we ask the board to ratify financial investment reports. The next item, we ask the board to approve budget amendment requests. You have uh, policy, localized policy manual update 114 that you will be um, uh, approving on Thursday. Any questions? The next item. Mm -hmm. so many. Uh, I know, I could have. <laughs> Get there in just a second. What was it, 175? I think 175. Okay. On page 175, uh, we asked the board to approve on first reading uh, CI local and CRB local. If you will recall, the board uh, requested that these come back. And uh, what you will note in CI local, uh, the question was uh, definition of personal property, and we just made a note of what that definition is. And then in CRB, it is coming back as the policy was originally uh, presented to the board. The next item, you have an addendum. Uh, we ask that the board to approve the proposed board calendar. And uh, the, the addendum is provided because the board self-evaluation was moved from January to May. The next item, we ask the uh, uh, board to approve uh, the attached resolutions proclaiming <coughs> February as Black History Month. The next item, we ask the board to approve uh, the resolution uh, proclaiming February 2020 as Career and Technology Education Month. The next item, we ask the board to approve a resolution proclaiming the week of February 3 through 7 as School Counselor Week. The next item, we ask that the board approve the change order number one for the addition of 19 days for permitting day, day delays and final payment of $119,350 to fast construction for the multi-campus renovations at Campbell, Navarro, Westendorf, Williams, and Williams Elementary. The next item, we ask the board to approve Charlie Calcomy surveying and A. <coughs> Inc., A. Jones, and Carter Company for professional topography surveying for the Jane Long Gymnasium renovations in the amount of $5,800. The next item, we ask the board to approve Rocket IT uh, Consulting for installation of the building technology systems at Tamaran Elementary School in the amount of $272,731. And those are the action items for the present. Yes, sir. Did I miss one? One, two, one. one. One more, Page 199. Well, I'm just that. on the road this evening. Forgive me. Um, the next item, we ask the board to approve Texas Air Systems for the HVAC modifications to air handling unit number five at Williams Elementary School in the amount of $1,850. And now we're finished with the Now we're finished. Do we have any audits to pay for this? Thank you.
you. All right. Uh, information items. Sir. Any of them that anybody wishes to ask questions about tonight? The district improvement plan quarterly updates going to be on Thursday. Yes, sir. Right. And just, I, can I just note that, please note um, in the information items, are any updates with the costs if anybody's been looking at on the project? Yes, that's all right. Okay. All right. Nothing else. We will go into closed session at 7.05. Four. <laughs> 551.071, 551 and 551.074, and 551.082. It is now 7.51, and we are back in session. Is there anything other further business for tonight? If not, 7.51, we will be adjourned. Thank you.